Welcome to Room for Discussion. Since 1964, 262,000 Colombians died in the armed conflict in the country. Las FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, were a major actor in this bloodshed. In 2016, the government and Las FARC signed a peace treaty that helped put an end to this tragedy. This won Juan Manuel Santos, the president at the time, the Nobel Peace Prize. Our guest today was on the front lines of building that peace. He worked as the High Commissioner for Peace, negotiating with Las Farc. He has brought human rights reform to Colombia's uh, corrupt, infamous military and helped restore order to the conflict-ridden jungles of one of the world's most beautiful countries. Please give a grand welcome to our guest today, Sergio Jaramillo. Please take a seat. Welcome, Mr. Jaramillo. So, first of all, how are you enjoying the European Spring? Well, it arrived at last, which is nice. We live in, in Brussels, and it's, um, the weather is actually even worse in Amsterdam, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're from Bogota originally. Um, I've heard that's not quite as tropical as I sort of imagined Colombia to be. So is it more like Amsterdam? No, not at all. I mean, my wife gets upset, but I actually say we have exactly the same weather in Brussels and in <laughs> Bogotá. It's always grey and rainy oh, and cold. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to admit, I think many people in the audience only know Colombia as a country from the media and from shows on Netflix. What's a big, major misconception we might have about Colombia? Well, Colombia, is a, first of all, is a very large country. It's about twice the size of France. And it has very difficult geography, which is part of the explanation of why we had an insurgency for such a long time. Um, but interestingly, Colombia was actually the first republic in Latin America, it was the first independent republic. Colombia is actually an older country than Belgium, strictly speaking. Really? Um, because we were independent in 1819. Mm -hmm and has had, in parallel with the, sadly, episodes of violence, uh, probably has had the most robust democratic tradition of any of the large countries of Latin America, virtually uninterrupted over 200 years, there were two such small episodes of, mm -hmm. of kind of soft military government, but right. nothing like what you've got in Argentina or Chile or mm -hmm. Mexico and places like that. So this is, this is a bizarre thing, and the difficulty about understanding Colombia is that you have this... You hear about this violence, but at the same time, it has, you know, it has very, we're here at the economics faculty next to the law faculty, and Colombia is like Italy, everyone's obsessed with the law, <laughs> perhaps for the same reasons, because there's so much illegal stuff going on, but um, more seriously, it's, it has a very strong kind of civilian tradition and strong institutions, very strong courts. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a mix that is difficult to understand from my okay. side. Okay, so you are High Commissioner of Peace, and that's not a job most countries have in government. Could you tell us a bit more what the day-to-day -day of a High Commissioner of Peace is? Yes, actually, that's very interesting because um, the conflict lasted for so long that at one stage in the mid-90s, the government decided to create a proper cabinet position mm -hmm. to negotiate with the guerrilla forces. And... Um, that actually t turned out to be a very good thing because uh, being, again, a very legalistic country, you need to be given special powers uh, to protect you, from, for example, from criminal prosecution for speaking to certain people. But more, uh, more importantly, it created an infrastructure. So I actually, as High Commissioner for Peace, I had uh, a structure and I was a member of cabinet, like a minister, and I had a kind of like a small ministry below me, which was the team that worked in this office of lawyers, communications people, experts of all kinds. And that's a huge advantage when you're facing a really complex problem because you really need very good people working at it. It's a mistake that lots of people make, including, surprisingly, the biggest countries like the US. I, I just last year, I was along with a friend, Jonathan Powell, who was Tony Blair's chief of staff and... Um, um, the main architect of the Good Friday Agreement. We were both, I suppose, the main advisors of the Afghan Republic mm -hmm. in the negotiations with the Taliban. And uh, 
I mean, the level of improvisation you saw from many European countries, but especially from the US, as how they approach negotiations was just staggering. And I always wonder why people do that, because your negotiation is, is as serious as a military operation. You really need to prepare, you need to, and you need to have a very good team. So having this office below me was a massive asset and was actually a good part of the explanation of the success of our negotiation yeah. was the team that was working on it. Right. And a lot of what you were working on there was with Las Farc. So could you yes. kind of introduce who they were and why they were different from other groups in Colombia? Yes. Well, that FARC were actually the, the largest insurgency in the history of Latin America. Uh, they got going in the early 60s, depending, 64, 66. Uh, their origin is linked to, on the one hand, a very strong episode of violence in the 50s in Colombia, which displaced lots of people, and including some some incipient communist guerrillas, but then in the 60s he also had um, the Cuban Revolution, so this was in the air. But the, but the interesting question is, okay, but that happened in other countries, why did the FARC last so long? You know, you had the same phenomenon of Venezuela. Uh, but, so the explanation is complex, mm -hmm. it has to do with Colombian history, it has to do again with the geography I was explaining, um, it has to do with the fact that it, by the late 70s, early 80s, they tapped into these massive resources linked to the drug economy and, and kidnapping and things like this. Right. But also to the fact that they were very disciplined and they, were, they had a very disciplined organization. So they, they lost lots of people, lots of commanders over time, but they could actually sort of rearrange over this massive territory of Colombia. So you could actually, in security terms, um, you could push them back, you could hit them hard, and we actually did, did that. Yeah. But they were never going to disappear. So at their peak in around 2000, they may have had as many as 20,000 men in arms, which is not little. And men and women, there's actually quite a lot of women in the FARC, about 20%. Oh, wow. And um, so if you're a responsible government, at one stage you have to actually realize that the best solution for everyone is to negotiate. You can't always negotiate. And perhaps we should have began by pointing out, you know, the, because it's, it's, this may be of interest to hear about Colombia, but the fact is that Europe is in the middle of the most serious crisis since the Second World War with the Ukraine, with the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. And, you, and all, of, all of these questions we have to face are actually very pertinent now. When do you negotiate? How do you create favorable conditions for negotiation? How do you prepare a negotiation so you're actually successful? Because in the case of Colombia, we actually had f three previous major efforts at negotiation, major right. peace processes, one in the mid-80s, one at the beginning of the 90s, and a major, major one which included a massive demilitarized zone from 99 to 2002, and they all failed. They all failed. So it's actually very easy to fail, and most negotiations actually fail. Um, so you have to actually prepare very carefully. And I'm a big believer in learning from others. We, we learned as much as we could from others. And I think that in the current circumstances in Europe, I'm not advocating negotiations now in the case of Ukraine, but I, I, I'm, I, I would plead for preparation. Right. Preparation so, is so the key. Why, why could you reach an agreement in 2016 then? Why did we? Why could you? Why was that the time? Well, it's a agreement? mix between between favorable conditions yeah. and the stars aligning, if you like. So, for example, but, but the, the stars don't align automatically. Because when, when, when you have major historical events and people look back, they always find a logic and they say, oh, well, that had to happen because of this or that. But actually, if you're actually in the mud, uh, you realize that things could have gone in many different ways. Uh, and I remember reading a phrase exactly said exact, saying exactly that of the memoirs of, very interesting, by the way, I recommend them, of, an, of the not so much admired, but I actually find them very impressive. Helmut Kohl, he wrote a, um, a special memoir of, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and re reunification, and just yeah. the explanation from inside, and you see, Yes, it looked like 
conditions were favorable, but a million different things would have happened. So you actually had to work very hard at this. And this is the, the main message I would pass on, that negotiations are very hard things, and you have to, to do, and you have to really prepare. You have to have great clarity about where you want to go to, technical back, capacity, and this is, a, this is actually why it worked. Right. Going back a bit to Colombia, could you maybe tell us more about the relationship with Las Farc and civilians? Because it lasted so long, uh, but maybe some of the audience don't know what so, it was like. So the thing about Colombia is, which is very difficult to understand if you're in a European country, is that um, you know you have not just two, but probably three or four different countries in the same territory in terms of level of development. So you've got, you know, today Colombia is most is at least three quarters, if not more, urban, right. and and life for not everyone, but a certain percentage of those living in in the cities is uh, not so different from life in a European city. Um, uh, we, we we still have a very large percentage of, of poor people and poverty compared to Europe, but but much much less than what we had. 50 or 60 years ago. Then you have the, what you might call the kind of consolidated countryside. Mm -hmm. But then you have the periphery uh, of the country where, where the Colombian state actually never had a, uh, a, a strong presence and which is ideal territory if you want to grow coca or if you want to set up a guerrilla force or um, if you want to mine illegally. Um, so, so they're behind because you're, many of you are economists, behind the problem of violence, there's a kind of problem of political economy, if you like, of a country, of how to integrate these this regions of the country. And part of what we tried to do with the peace agreement was precisely to go beyond simply the disarmament of the FARC and create incentives for the Colombian state to actually take more seriously this issue, how do you integrate this periphery mm -hmm. and how you honor the rights of all those Colombians who live there, but they actually live there as second-class citizens. You've touched this in your uh, conversation, um, but I think it might not be clear for some. What was the relationship between the drug trade and Las Farc? So that's that's a complex issue because the Farc were got going as a, a, a and actually remained a pretty classic Marxist-Leninist guerrilla. And actually, and that is the main explanation why they lasted so long, because as I explained, they had this great capacity to organize themselves. But naturally, with the resources, so what they started doing in, in the, at least since the early 80s, was to tax mm -hmm. coca cultivation. Uh, and and you know, as, that, as, the, as that trade got bigger, they got more and more involved, so that by the 90s, they were actually deeply involved in the drug trade and were not just taxing uh, uh, growers, mm -hmm. but were to some extent uh, themselves in that link of the chain of the trade, uh, which gave them huge resources and, and allowed them to become very strong militarily. But interestingly, this also worked against them because it isolated them from the population because they had all the resources they needed from the drug trade and also from kidnapping and other resources. So actually, strategically, in a way, it was, um, it gave them some military successes in the 90s, but in the long run, it isolated them from the population, it isolated them from the original political course, uh, so that by the early 2000s, you had this massive insurgent army that actually had lost its way politically and, and was increasingly, frankly, hated by, by a large percentage of the Colombian people, which made the negotiation difficult because people dislike the FARC so much. Moving on to the negotiations, there was a 15-time, 50-year implementation period. When you started negotiating, what were the main things you wanted to be accomplished by 2031? So let me just say two or three things about how the negotiation yeah. was organized, because mm -hmm. it might be, might be interesting for, for those who have an interest in such things. So because we had actually failed so many times mm -hmm. in negotiations, and negotiations are dangerous things because they, they kind of dis destabilize things. People start yeah. expecting things to happen and they don't, and, and they influence the politics, especially in the democracy. So President Santos had to be, he had the, the, um, 
the capacity to identify the right moment to negotiate, which is a very, very important thing. Um, the, if you talk to negotiation experts, they, they very often talk about something they call the a mutually hurting stalemate, and they say until you reach that position, you can't really negotiate. But that's actually not true, uh, because politically, the government then was not in a mutually hurting stalemate. Could have happily, for the president, politically, the easiest thing to do would be to continue with a successful security campaign. But the responsible thing to do was actually to put an end to the conflict mm -hmm. and to identify the, the, the right moment. How did, uh, but, he, how did he... And he, this was in 2010. Yeah. Okay. See, because the, the, the curious, bizarre thing is that he had just... Just before he'd been Minister of Defence, I, I was actually his deputy. Yeah. I was the Deputy Minister of Defence before, <clears throat> and moved from, from the world of defence and security to sort of starting the secret negotiations, which turned out to be a very big advantage because these guys respected us because they knew we knew a lot about them. And how did he and, identify the right moment to begin the negotiations? Well, because he thought that even though they were still fairly, I mean, they've been hit hard, but they were still very, you know, they were strong, the, and Colombia is a, is, a, is a big country. And by the way, this is, this is actually an issue of, of controversy in Colombia, because the hard right says, oh, why did you negotiate? Would you have just yeah. keep attacking the FARC? But that's lunacy. I mean, it's never happened anywhere in the world that you actually defeat an insurgency in the sense that they just go, it doesn't happen. And the cost is massive. And there's no point if you can actually do a proper negotiation. But you have to be very careful. So what we did was, starting in mid-2010, we opened a back channel to the commander of the FARC, which only four people, strictly speaking, knew about. The commander of the FARC, President Santos, number two of the FARC, and myself. And the number two and myself were kind of managing this right. channel. And through that channel, we agreed to have a a first secret meeting it took a very long time to actually organize that because the FARC were very nervous about their own security mm -hmm. because we've been very successful at tracking them down and dropping smart bombs on them so they they were very worried rightly and so we agreed to that we would meet in Cuba mm -hmm. with this with the help also of the Norwegians and so a year and a half later in February of 2012 so exactly 10 years ago, we first met face to face. I, I actually led the government team and had six months of secret talks, which was a miracle because Colombia is a, a medium mad country and keeping anything secret is extremely difficult. But we managed to do so by going to taking all kinds of extreme measures, not taking commercial planes, flying on this tiny um, uh, uh, Cessna, um, over the Caribbean, that sounds and a um, like a spy novel. <laughs> and then, and then, on the basis of of what of a framework agreement we reached, the president went public and said, "We're actually now going to have a peace process." But peace process had already started um, six or two months before, or two years before, and and so we had a roadmap. And with that roadmap, we negotiated for four more years. So the whole thing was very long, but it was very structured. See, so this is actually what kept us afloat was having right. being very methodology, uh, having a very strong methodology, and and being very rigorous in what we did. So, in the negotiations in Cuba, Cuba, for those that don't know, is a communist country. So there were some sympathy with Les FARC. There were rumors that that sympathy also led them to help them out. There was a rumor that they were bugging the Colombian delegates and passing on information. Did you ever consider that during the negotiations? Well, I, I mean, you, the reason we were in Cuba is because the only conditions we set for actually starting to talk to the FARC is that the, the first meetings had to be, had to be secret yeah. and direct, and they had to happen abroad because all the previous processes had, had happened in Colombia and they had failed. And because of the security uh, situation, for the FARC and their worries. Um, they wanted to go to Venezuela, but there was no way we were going to go to Venezuela because we had great tension with Chavez, even though President Santos, one of the brilliant things he did was to turn Chavez around and make him uh, you know, literally move him from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. So he actually played a big role at the beginning of the peace process in persuading the FARC mm -hmm. to negotiate. Uh, but we couldn't go to Venezuela. So the only place that the FARC would accept 
that for us was acceptable was, was actually Cuba. And we also knew that Cuba had an interest in improving its relation with the US. So you make all these calculations. And it actually turned out to exactly like that, because at the same time as we started our secret talks, the US started having their own secret contacts with the Cubans, yeah. you might remember. The Obama administration mm-hmm. uh, had the secret talks with the Cubans, yeah. which by kind of by coincidence, um, but actually both things were related, happened at the same time. So, so we thought the Cubans would want to make this work, and they did. They invested hugely on this, and they did a, a fabulous job. Of right, so they were quite helpful in the end. Though. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. And how else did you gain the trust of Las Farc after years of you know, being enemies? Well, that's a question you all often get asked. But I, I, I have a rather sort of um, hard view of this issue of trust yeah. in the sense that if you're in a really serious and tough negotiation, mm-hmm. you don't trust... It's not about trusting the people. Okay. It's about trusting the results of the process. Right. So it's not about sitting down and getting along and saying, oh, Angus, you look like a nice guy and uh, I think I trust you. Is okay, we've agreed that we're going to do this in secret and after four months of negotiating secret, you realize that Angus is not leaking. So I say, oh, Angus is behaving properly. Mm-hmm. So I begin to <laughs> trust you a bit more. Right. And, and vice versa. And then by the end of the six months, you actually reach... Uh, 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 what we call a framework agreement, like a roadmap, and you, you sort of signed up to this roadmap and said, well, Angus looks like he actually is more interesting than I thought. So it's actually the, the results of the process and the investment of both sides in the process mm-hmm. that, I, that begins to build this basis of trust. Were there any moments when you just had a casual conversation with the FARC leaders? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What did you talk about? Yes. Football? Uh, the, no... You see, again, we had you know we had the secret talks where we, we where we were just two very small teams, right. basically five on each side, and then when it went public, uh, it became a much bigger affair, with, I mean, ten people on each side in in the room, but actually behind that, big delegations and media and a completely different thing. So it became much more uh, bizarrely institutionalized and kind of quasi bureaucratic. And so then, actually, it became more difficult to have those informal mm-hmm. right. conversations. So we actually set up a system, which we call the 2 plus 2, which was that we would meet at the house of the Norwegians, the, the top two guys on each, on each side, we then expanded that a bit, uh, to have this kind of very informal conversations where you could actually... Because proper negotiations, they become like... You know, it's like a theater piece. Yeah. And everyone is very aware that it's being listened to, and that there's an audience both on your own side, and uh, you had some internationals in the room, and so forth. So you needed a space where you can actually sort of throw things around without any commitment, and say, "Well, what do you think of this language? What do you think if we tried to? You know, what do you think of this idea? Or how do you see this problem?" And uh, so we increasingly use that as a space to kind of try things out, and that's very important. You need the formal thing, but you also need this, this informal. Space, right? To be able to compare. It, it, it's really nice that you had also those lighter moments during a very tense period. But you've also previously talked about some very hard moments. You have talked about bringing victims to Cuba to share their stories. Do you think maybe you could share some of their mm. stories with us? Yes, yeah, that that probably was the most, if I may say so, most interesting and innovative mm-hmm. element of the negotiation, which was that. The, the secret talks were about agreeing this roadmap, which was agreeing to, you know, what is this process about? What are the items of the agenda? What are the rules by which we're going to actually um, um, negotiate? And when we were discussing the items of the agenda, we insisted that there had to be a point on victims. Because for most Colombians, the conflict meant victimhood, meant being a victim. I mean, Colombia is still today number two or three in the world in terms of IDPs, of internally displaced people. And, you know, the numbers are huge. Uh, 200 million. uh, Around uh, 8 million displaced, 300,000 dead, uh, probably 40,000 
plus either forcefully disappeared or kidnapped right. um, and so forth. So this is what people actually, mm -hmm. this is their idea of the conflict. And you have to deal with this, especially because the logic of what we were doing was not simply to get the FARC to lay down their weapons, but to guarantee or to try to guarantee uh, that violence would not flare again and, and to have a logic of so-called non-recurrence or non-repetition. So that included actually dealing with the past in, in a very hard way. Um, it was very, very difficult. And, and so one of the things we did was to actually have delegations of victims come to the negotiation table in Havana, which were picked by, by uh, the U, uh, combination of the UN, a major university, and the church sent five delegations, at our behest, of course, five delegations of 12 victims each. And so we'd spend a whole morning. It was like a, if anybody has seen a, a footage of the South African Truth Commission, it was a little bit like that. It was like a live Truth Commission, but it actually was at the negotiating table and was very, very powerful. And, um, and because of that, we actually managed to agree to a very complex system where, for the first time ever, a guerrilla force agreed to actually go before a tribunal mm -hmm. and acknowledge they had committed very grave crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, yeah. and so did actually state agents, which, by the way, I just mentioned South Africa, something that never happened in South Africa because no member of the South African Defense Force ever went before the Truth Commission. And in this case, you actually get a sentence. You get a much more lenient sentence, mm -hmm. but you still get a sentence. And this is actually happening already, and it's already this, this special tribunal is working, right. and so some things are happening in Colombia that are, for people who are interested in so-called transitional justice and so forth, are, are very important because um, we actually, so far, it's only starting, but so far, we managed to set up a system that the International Criminal Court, the ICC not very far from here in The Hague, decided that it was actually compliant with the Rome Statute, because we are parties to the Rome Statute. And so you could actually deliver justice in the context of a peace agreement in accordance with your, with your Rome Statute obligations. And that's what's happening now. So it's actually big news for anybody who's interested in those things. Yeah, that's enormous. Um, but how did you actually convince you know, FARC fighters and military personnel as well to willingly go to trial? Well, it was willingly. extraordinarily hard. It was the hardest thing yeah. of the whole negotiation. That's why partly why it was, took so long. That point on victims took us a full, believe it or not, a full year and a half to actually get through. And the, the basis, the, the question which is, as you put it, why, why would anybody agree to that? It's actually the same thing the FARC would say to us. You know, <laughs> have you ever heard of a guerrilla force agreeing to go to jail? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, this, is a, this is a political negotiation. And then you say, well, look, this is the 21st century, sorry. And then you have to sort of, um, we have all these victims. And so the, the reason, they're actually not strictly speaking going to go to jail, but they will serve a sentence. Yeah. They will serve a sentence which will, with certain obligations. And pay reparations, In terms of, of, of pay reparations and in terms of, of so-called restorative justice. And do a series of works in, in bits of the Colombian countryside. And so the reason why I ended up agreeing to this was it's complex, but it's partly because we agreed that this system would be a system that would address the rights of all victims, not just victims of the FARC. So President Santos took the courageous decision to say yes, this will also we you know, if members of the Colombian Armed Forces, police, mm -hmm. state agents have committed serious crimes, they should also go before the strike. Um, so that made a difference. The victims themselves made a very big difference. And from the point of view of the FARC, in the end, having also some legal certainty was not a small thing, because you can actually do a, you can do a bogus blanket amnesty, which we weren't going to do. We actually told them in one of these private meetings, look, blanket amnesty, that's never going to happen. So, you know, what are we going to do about this? Right. Um, and so you start building on this, and then you had get experts coming in and talking to them, and saying, look, you know, this, this is how the world works now, and um, the Norwegians were very good in this, bringing experts to talk to the FARC in Havana, 
until people realize, okay, the world has changed, the yeah. expectations are different. On the point about victimhood, do you think there was justice for the victims and their families? Uh, absolutely. Especially, I mean, it, it's, it's an ongoing exercise. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, of course, we have to take a step back and have a, a little bit of a discussion about the concept of justice in the context of a transition from war to peace. So if, you're, if your standard is what would happen at, at an ordinary court, you might say, well, you fall far short of sending somebody to prison for 30 years. Yeah. In fact, you say, really yes, that is true. But actually, first of all, it's not possible because nobody negotiates to go to prison for 30 years. But secondly, it's actually not even what necessarily the victims want because very often uh, victims privilege the truth, wanting to know what happened and, and who was responsible and why this happened. They, they privileged, others privileged reparations of various kinds or finding the remains of the beloved um, and also some form of justice. So, so if you take this broader view of victims' rights in sort of today's standard doctrine of truth, justice and reparations, then you actually do much more with a, with a comprehensive system like this than you would do with an, with an ordinary court. May, may be sent, send somebody to prison, but that's it. You wouldn't know what happened. Right. Now you're actually getting the truth out. And getting the truth out is part of the peace process, and it's a painful thing. And, and, and this is why the a peace process is, is, is truly an ongoing thing. The peace process in Colombia wasn't just negotiating and signing an agreement. It's what happens afterwards. But there was a big of backlash on this point. We had a referendum where the yes was, should there be peace, and the no was, no, yes. there shouldn't. And the no won, despite what a lot of people expected. Yes. Do you think... Well, conduct... because it is directly related to this issue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's important to remember the numbers. No? So, sadly, we only had 36% uh, of the electorate vote. Yeah. And we actually lost this referendum by 0.3 of a percent. Yeah. 90, by 60,000 votes. votes. And the main argument against one, against us... Uh, led by former president, uh, uh, the campaign was led by former president Uribe, was to say that there was too much impunity, that this wasn't good enough. And, I mean, you can, you know, if a victim says, we're not satisfied with this, well, I mean, it's certainly their right. So you, but, it, but actually, what, what history will show was that this was actually a, a political campaign. Um, I, I, I fully... Um, respect the uh, Colombians who may have disagreed with the negotiator or the victims who may have said they, they, they disagreed. Interestingly, victims and the victim movements became one of the biggest supporters of the peace agreement. But President Uribe himself, former President Uribe, who, who led the campaign against, five years later, so just before we voted on the 2nd of October of 16, he said, you know, we don't want an agreement with impunity. We must vote against this. Yeah. And five years later, he met the president of the Truth Commission. This happened just last year. And in an informal chat, well, not so informal because it was with him and it was being televised, he said, well, he's called Father the Ru. So he said, Father the Ru, why don't we think about having a general amnesty and just forgetting about the whole thing? So, so you say, well, it doesn't look like his uh, uh, worries about impunity were so serious when he's actually ready to sort of forget about everything. But it was politics, which is, which is a very interesting issue, the difficulty of doing a, a peace negotiation in a democracy where issues around peace and negotiations are at the heart of the political struggle. So they, will, they become politicized. And that's why in places like I mean, Northern Ireland was very difficult. This is why Israel-Palestine is almost impossible to solve because of the politics. So in 2019, I think we should look at how the treaties actually performed. Um, and in 2019, demobilized FARC militants picked up arms again. And there are today uh, some reports of 2,300 FARC uh, insurgents. Um, some report as many as 5,500 FARC-affiliated insurgents active. Um, so how did the treaty allow a... Uh, rearmament to occur? No. No? That, that's actually not right. I'll okay. explain why. So, we have actually in Colombia 
over time, just as we have the Office of the Peace Commissioner, we created a special institution, uh, an agency to look after the reintegration of former combatants. Right. Uh, it's like a fairly robust thing. And they keep very close tabs on, on everything. And the, their numbers are around, last I heard was literally about 95, 95% of the FARC force that signed the peace agreement is still in the peace process, 95%. Right. What happens is that you, you've got a number of mid-level commanders mm -hmm. who, interestingly, not mostly after the signature yeah. of the peace agreement, decided to leave the peace yeah. process and go back. Because if you think about the Colombian conflict, you have actually a proper yeah. conflict. But it's being supported on the insurgency side by this illegal economy. So some of these guys thought, oh, I'd rather go back and do what I used to do before, which was actually run this cocoa economy. Uh, and so you get a system going again where you, they start recruiting people again. So if you like, bits of what you might call the FARC system right. were revived by these commanders. But those 2,500 yeah. or 3,000 fighters are not, most of them are not former FARC but, fighters. But even so, if most of them are new fighters, shouldn't you have been prepared for this in the negotiations? Absolutely. So the okay. main, um, if we were at trial, the main canes against us, mm -hmm. even though we actually knew this, was not to have done enough to, to implement the agreement at the, at the right speed because all of these problems that have emerged were completely predictable. It was perfectly clear that those coca fields would still be there, that somebody was going to want to take control, uh, that some of the FARC fighters could desert. Now, it's obviously an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do, <laughs> to do uh, quickly what the Colombian state has not done in 50 or 100 years, but... Uh, even though we were very aware of this, I think we could have had m a much more forceful implementation in the first years after the signature. Right. So you're touching on this. There what, hasn't been a strict decrease on the amount of cocaine exportations from Colombia, which contributes to criminality in mm. exponential amounts. Do you think there should have been a, a more focused approach to the peace implementation, more focus on decreasing drug activity in the country? Well, I mean, this whole issue of drugs is, as people know in this country, extraordinarily complex because there are many, many sides to this. So, uh, I mean, you can be a, um, I mean, a, a rational pessimist around the idea that you're ever going to win something called the war on drugs mm -hmm. because in the case of cocaine and cocoa fields in particular, if you look at it globally, all these massive efforts at huge cost actually hardly make a dent in the problem. And you say, okay, that's true, and I would agree with that. Then you have the issue of, of organized crime that builds around this. And that's something that, in my view, really you have to go after. You cannot tolerate organized crime to take over your, your country because most of those organizations are not just doing drugs. They, they start exercising control and power in various ways. and. I mean, even in this country, you have a serious problem with organized crime. You really have to be fighting it. And then, in the case of countries like Colombia or Peru, you have coca cultivation, mm -hmm. and which becomes a development problem, and, but also a problem of security. Because where there is coca cultivation, there is insecurity. Um, so what the agreement tried to do, above all, was to have a more intelligent approach to how to deal with the coca fields yeah. through, through rural development. Uh, bi building on some experience, on some successful experiences we already had had in Colombia, which I was actually myself in Dublin, uh, um, but that that actually hasn't gone so well, sadly. Partly because we've had a a, a, a government mm -hmm. that was elected on on built its political platform by campaigning against the peace process, and when they were then in power, they noticed that they actually had to implement this agreement. <laughs> That the whole world was looking at them, that the Security Council was looking at them, but they did it in a very half-hearted way, with not nearly enough resources. So this problem remains, but there's actually at least clarity about what needs to be done. Right. But why weren't you more prepared in the treaty for a change of government down the line? 
Because so far it's slowed significantly, well, only 50% of the commitments very, have been reached. It's a very difficult thing. You know, you don't yeah. think, about, think, think about a more familiar case. Think about what happened in Israel in the mid-90s. So you have the secret negotiations that come up with the Oslo Agreement, which are, as you probably all know, not a final agreement. It was a kind of roadmap thing, but still much more than anything that had been achieved before. Uh, and then what happens? Then Rabin is killed. Yeah. The leader of this whole thing is killed. And then uh, Shimon Peres, uh, what Israelis say is that makes the mistake of not calling for elections immediately, uh, waits too long, and then Netanyahu wins, who was uh, with the coup against everything mm -hmm. that they were doing. So these are the big risks of negotiating in a democracy. It's a real problem, and there's nothing you can do. I mean, it's all politics. So you just have to accept it. Well, I mean, you have to try not to lose, uh, of course, and to and to uh, and this is actually a very, very important point, because when people think about negotiations, they're always thinking about, okay, how did you actually negotiate this or this this agreement and how does this work and the questions mm -hmm. of trust. But, the, but yeah, negotiation has actually many negotiations going on at the same time, including a negotiation with your own constituency, with, your own, with the people of your own country, especially if you're going to run a, a referendum as we did. So you actually have to do a lot of heavy lifting politically to create the conditions. And, and that's another thing which we're, perhaps we, we failed in, in not having... I mean, through the negotiations, mm -hmm. mostly polls showed there was very large support for the negotiation. Mm -hmm. But then once the really tough politics got yeah. going, we didn't really have a strong enough basis and we should have worked more on that. Okay. Um, and on that note, I think it would be interesting to open it up for some audience questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Well, uh, the, the, the woman in the green, please. Do I need a mic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm Louisa Sir, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Uh, I have two uh, questions. Uh, one, actually, in my understanding, uh, there's another reason why some of the FARC... Uh, of uh, politicians went back into the guerrilla, and that has to do with the paramilitary that you didn't speak about much, but which is still a major violent uh, actor in um, Colombia. A few weeks ago, one of the big uh, drug lords was extradited to the US, and they managed to paralyze the whole coastal area of um, Colombia. The paramilitaries basically enforced the lockdown, and they are a major threat to ex FARC who are politicians. So, could you speak a bit about that? And then mm -hmm. the second question. Um, there's, of course, a very um, exciting election uh, going on right now in Colombia. Um, and um, Petro, uh, who is a very fresh candidate who um, embodies the hope of a lot of uh, young and working class uh, Colombians, he's an ex guerrilla but uh, not with the FARC, but a more moderate uh, group. What do you think, um, if he gets elected, what would that mean for the peace process? I think we will actually touch upon the later topic later on. So if we can just stick to the first question about Palomero and Sarali for now. Okay, so for those of you who know nothing about Colombia, um, over time, you had, especially since the, well, beginning of the late 80s, but especially in the 90s, you had this what in Colombia are called paramilitary militias were built originally by, by lar large cattle ranchers, but also by drug traffickers who had property in the countryside to, um, to attack the FARC. And sadly, they did this also um, more often than not in, 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 uh, in, co in coordination with the military, which at the time, in the 90s, was given the size of the problem, uh, comparatively weak. And this became a huge issue. So, so you had the Colombian armed forces fighting the FARC, but you also had the paramilitary militias fighting the FARC. And, but it wasn't exactly a tripartite thing because, uh, because of these links that existed between the Colombian military and the paramilitary. Now, those big paramilitary militias were mostly demobilized in the government of Alvaro Uribe from the years 2004-06 as, as kind of fully-fledged armies. But the, the kind of 
how to describe it, you, you know, the, the economies that, just like in the case of FARC, that kept that going, those interests um, remained. So, I mean, there's, one can have a discussion about the use of the term paramilitary. I mean, that's actually not important. What's actually important is that as the FARC moved out of certain areas in 2017, when they disarmed, then there was, there was if you like, a kind of vacuum. And uh, the, I mean, I would call them drug traffickers because they're basically drug traffickers, but we can call them paramilitaries, I don't mind. Uh, those organizations started fighting amongst each other for control. And sadly, the way in a place like rural Colombia you end up exercising control is by killing people, especially if you're weak militarily. What you do is you terrorize the population as a way of showing you know, who's there and, and, and scaring everyone. By, by the way, I, I was actually asked, by, I shouldn't mention this, but I was asked about two months ago by, about the, by the Financial Times what I thought would happen in the Ukraine when the Russians got into these areas where they, you know, the people would be against them. And I said, well, sadly, probably what's going to happen is they're going to start killing these people. And, and then a month later, you saw the pictures of Bucha. This, this is how it works. It's horrible, but that's how it works. So the effect of this is that um, uh, a, a significant number of former FARC fighters, so you have 13,000 mm -hmm. who demobilized, and about 300,000, about 300, 300 um, you have the number of right, or close to 300 have been killed since in the last five years of those 1,300 of those 13,000, 300. Um, they, the, those who've actually been killed have not included so far any of those who are, are active in politics, in, in Congress or in Assembly. But it's obviously an extremely serious problem. And we have a verification mission of the UN monitoring all of this. And this is actually rightly the main worry. And so, and and the, the bizarre thing, the tragic thing, but also sort of the appalling thing, is that the current government that's supposed to be a kind of right, hard right government that's supposed to be about security has turned out to be completely um, you know, terrible at security and at creating the security conditions for the peace mm -hmm. agreement to be implemented in those fringe areas and has been completely overwhelmed. Uh, and if the peace agreement had been implemented as planned, do you think it would have solved I, the power? Well, absolutely. No? Okay. Absolutely, because uh, a key idea, which actually the, the current government picked up on but hasn't done properly, in or a key disposition of the peace agreement, are these very ambitious programs called rural development programs with a territorial approach, which cover about 20% plus of Colombia's territory, 16 of them. And the interesting thing is that the way we designed them was for, for this to be a real exercise in participatory planning to do it to do it with the population in a model which I called myself at a conference ages ago at Harvard, territorial peace. And some of this actually, a lot of this happened, but you actually have to have the resources to move things, to create employment, to create a, what technical people call a, a critical mass in situ so that people think that see the things are changing, and you actually have less of a vacuum. And also you have to have a proper security strategy that is aligned with the moment of transition, which is a tough thing to do, but you have to do it. And this is exactly what the current government is, has been absolutely terrible at. And uh, what we hope is, you know, we better when we get a new government in August. We have time for one more audience question, if anybody's interested. Uh, the gentleman in front. In in grey. I, I think you you yeah. What? Can I do it then? Sure, we'll we'll give it to you. I, I <laughs> uh, we have a saying in Moldova when three when two people argue, the third one wins. So uh, sorry, folks. Uh, next time, have to be more uh, quick. Uh, my name is Laura, and I'm an economics student. Uh, you have mentioned that basically there were other countries or third parties involved into the facilitation of the negotiation process. Um, and we see that there were attempts um, of other countries to get involved into solving the Ukrainian war. Uh, 
but not only by offering a platform, but having head of states trying to actually create communication channels in between the Ukrainian government and the Russian government. My question is, to which extent should third parties or other countries get involved into a negotiation process so that it's more of an asset rather than it being something that can deter and create more conflict? Yes. That's a very good question because this is something that is uh, at the same time very important but you have to design things very carefully because otherwise it, it can boomerang on you. Um, so I, I do think that any really difficult conflict and, or war or hard negotiation benefits from, from having a third party facilitate things and especially... Um, you know, the presence of internationals who are serious, who are actually watching, uh, as in our case, we actually had a fairly minimal, uh, minimalistic approach to facilitation. Um, we didn't actually have proper mediation. We had a direct negotiation with the FARC. But these countries that support us, Cuba and Norway, were hugely important in all kinds of ways, in giving guarantees to both sides and making sure that everyone behaved properly, in, in helping with very complex things like picking far commanders out of the middle of the jungle and taking them to Havana, which they did together with the ICRC. So that, those are very important roles, and to, and to make sure that both sides are actually you know, serious and behave properly. But as you rightly um, suggest in your question, you have to do this in an intelligent manner. So if you ask me what was going on now, I personally, my own personal view is that it's a very bad idea for for the German Chancellor and for the President of France to be talking to Putin on the phone all the time. I mean, that, that serves no purpose whatsoever. Um, and it sends the wrong signal. Um, a different thing is for somebody else to have a, a quiet channel. I'm in favor of, of, of rather, of, of back channels. And I also think that um, if this war ever gets to a negotiating table, which it will at some stage, then you need it's a little bit of what I'm trying to suggest is you really need to think carefully about the division of labor and roles and missions. So I don't think the role of France and Germany is to be the facilitators of the end of the war in the Ukraine. I think they should be supporting the Ukrainians. Uh, but I, I think that the UN is there to do exactly that. And uh, it's quite scandalous that it took the Secretary General of the UN such a long time to actually get going and to get on a plane and to go and talk to this very size because somebody actually has to pay the cost of opening those, that space. But you have to be careful how, how you do it, you have to choose the time properly, and um, probably you should begin in something that's not public. Right. So, as promised, we're gonna touch upon the election now. Um, the two persons that have passed to the second run are Petro, a left-wing populist, who was a former member of the M19 guerrilla group that they mobilized uh, years ago. The other candidate is um, Rodolfo Hernandez. He's a right-wing populist. He is an entrepreneur and the former mayor of a middle-sized city, Bucaramanga. Of these two candidates, who do you think is better for peace? Well, let me say the following. Oh, just because for those of you who, I suppose, or most of you, no reason we should know anything about Colombian politics, but we have a system that is very much like France, you know, two rounds. And so you get lots of candidates in the first round, then you have a runoff in the second round with just two candidates. Um, so in the first round, the top four guys were a, a representative of the traditional political parties, uh, but who was also supported by the hard right and was also supported by the government. Mm -hmm. Then you had uh, Petro, who is this former guerrilla, mentioned the question, who's run already two or three times for president, actually since 2010, and is, being, is going increasingly up his chances. Um, then you had this figure that came out of nowhere, who's mayor called Hernandez, who is a, who is a kind of actually standard populist, mm. um, and it's at this stage still difficult to say what you know, you could call him a right-wing populist, but actually a lot of the stuff he says is more similar to what AMLO says in Mexico, which is not exactly right-wing. So it's a very bizarre mixture, but what is clear is that he's, he's a classic anti-politician. 
And then you had somebody who was the preferred candidate of a lot of people, including myself, who was from the sort of, you know, standard center, uh, who did terribly, sadly. And what ended up happening is that in the second round, you got not, as most people thought, the traditional, the representative of traditional parties in the government, but the guy from the left yeah. and this impossible to describe populist. Um, so this actually has put the, the left-wing candidate in a very difficult position because he embodied change. He embodied actually also, in the eyes of many people, um, a, a part of Colombia that normally has no access to power, having access to power. So he embodied a much more of a political transition, or at least that's how he thought of, it, of himself. But this guy also campaigned against traditional politics, this populist. So it's actually now much more difficult for, the, for Petro, and he actually may lose. It's actually quite likely that he's going to lose to the populist because he has a much more difficult target because his other guy is also for change, and he's, he uses the standard language of we, we must fight corruption, we must put all these corrupt politicians in jail, and all of this. So it's, he's, it's much more difficult to characterize. Um, and I, I won't say what I think myself about uh, how they're going to do with regard to the peace process, simply because I, I adopted the rule um, about a year ago that I wasn't going to get involved in the politics of the elections, simply because I just want to make sure that whoever wins, I can continue to sort of insist on the need to implement the peace agreement. But in terms of, if you like, a political transition, as you would expect after the signature of a peace agreement, then certainly Petro represents that much more than Hernandez. Right. And if either one was to call you up and uh, help lead the peace, future peace negotiations, is there one that you would prefer? To no. Work no. <laughs> you would no, just I've, never I've, negotiate I've, I've, again? I've, I've, I've had enough of okay. the negotiation myself. Thank you very much. Right, of course. And kind of our final question to close up this interview is, are you hopeful for the future of Colombia? I am. I mean, Colombians, as often happens in countries, have, have difficulty appreciating what has been achieved. And if you see where the country was in 2000 and where the country was in, in 2000, you know, all European foreign ministries and the State Department would have a big warning sign saying, don't travel to Colombia, you're going to get kidnapped. Or, or, and uh, in 2016, Colombia was sort of the number two recommendation of the, of the New York Times and, you know, the 50 countries in the world you yeah. should travel to. Um, and I mean, that's a, perhaps a, a, a silly example, but it's really massive it's change. Um, but the thing is that a peace, the problem is that a peace agreement is not just about, a peace process is not just about reaching an agreement and even implementing the agreement, it's about exercising a certain kind of political leadership that shows people that you know there's a, a certain kind of future and pushes things in that direction. And so sadly, the politics in Colombia, after the signature of the agreement, haven't actually been aligned with the, like, the strategic needs of the peace process. Um, so I'm not pessimistic because I, I, the, uh, one of the good things is that Many of the lies that were told about the peace agreement at the time of the referendum five years ago, but it's clear to everyone that the kind of things they used to say in present, former President Rio used to say that we were going to turn Colombia into Venezuela or that the FARC was going to take over the country politically. Well, none of that happened, it's obvious, and people see the benefits. So I'm, I'm optimistic that the process will continue, but I'm not sure if it's going to continue with enough strength if we don't manage to align the politics more with the objectives of the peace process. And on that note, everybody, thank you so much for coming to Room for Discussion today. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Jaramillo, for also coming. Thank you very much for having me. Um, next week, we have the cryptocurrency uh, panel discussion. So I expect to see you all there at 1 p.m. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.